this is Liza Ryan on Community Matters with Think Tech Hawaii, and I'm here today with Bo Rowland to talk about international education and cultivating the whole person. So thank you for joining us, Bo. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, today we're going to talk about a little bit about your experiences um, and uh, as an entrepreneur and co-founding an education group called Zeal Education uh, out of China. And yes. so when, and you are, you're from here, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah, I grew up here. Uh, born and raised. Born and raised. Uh huh. <laughs> and then when did you when did you decide to move to China? Well, I think initially what what drove me to China was actually going to high school in Hawaii and beginning to learn Chinese in seventh grade. Oh, wow. And then when I was given the opportunity to study abroad um, during my junior year of high school, that really sort of cemented my relationship with the country. Now that's kind of rare to start Chinese so early within the United States. I mean, now it's getting more and more popular, but uh, that was pretty prescient on your part or the part of your parents to think about taking Chinese at that time. Yeah, I think, I, I don't know what did it for me. I think it was partly that I'm Chinese, mm -hmm. one-fourth Chinese, and also that I thought I had the best chance of wanting to remember the language because I might have economic ties with it later. Mm. <laughs> and so do you have grandparents who still speak Chinese? No, no. One, okay. one claims he speaks Cantonese, but I think that's only for betting on the Super Bowl in Chinatown. <laughs> So, so then when did, uh, what was your purpose of moving to China about five years ago? Essentially, you know, I, uh, I was finishing college at Berkeley and I met the right people. Um, I met an amazing guy who was finishing up his PhD at Stanford mm -hmm. and he was from China, but he had had the opportunity to study abroad for college and also for his graduate work. Mm -hmm. um, he, he had the initial idea of essentially serving as college counselors for Chinese students interested in studying abroad. Mm -hmm. And because I had been in China before, studied the language continuously throughout college, I thought, oh, this would be a great opportunity to potentially do something between the two countries. And so then, uh, so then let's talk about what Zeal Education Group is. So it's based mm -hmm. out of that idea of kind uh -huh. of being college, or we call it college counselor for mm -hmm. Uh, Chinese students thinking of doing exchanges abroad. So is exactly. It, is it so? Explain to me more about what that's like. Yeah. So to so to give you a background of what Chinese students face when they're interested in studying abroad, they have no sort of infrastructure within their schools for doing any kind of um, studying abroad. At least most schools. And so we thought that perhaps American college students with sympathies or interest in China uh, could help them could literally mentor them step by step through the college applications process. Mm -hmm. And with that initial idea in mind, we decided to sort of, on the ground, we realized that they needed much more than college counseling. They needed mentoring um, in a range of skills. So what are, what are some of those skills that you recognize that they needed? Mm -hmm. um, so initially, we, we called ourselves sort of teachers of soft skills. And soft skills is a really slippery term, even in English, it's hard to define. It's hard to define things like critical thinking or, um, or empathy um, and why those things would be important to, one, a high school student and two, getting into college. Yeah. Um, but essentially it gave us the wiggle room to be able to um, develop a curriculum over time that really met the needs of each student. Now, was there, is there a large market? Are there many Chinese students trying to come to the U.S. to study here? Yeah, um, that's been one of the biggest booms in, in the higher education industry. Um, every year, there's about 250,000 students uh, studying abroad from China. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the, as uh, Chinese are getting more and more comfortable with coming to the States, where are they looking, what kind of schools are they looking to go to? There's a whole range, um, and the industry that serves them is, is also serving that range. So, for example, there will be some kids who are strictly interested in summer programs and maybe some enrichment work with, with, uh, with their English, uh, while other kids are interested in going directly to community colleges and then eventually going on to four-year institutions. Mm -hmm. Now, we were working with a pretty wide spectrum where kids were interested in going to uh, U.S. News and World Report uh, top 20 schools, um, and as well as like going off to the U.K. Okay. even for school. Okay. Now, guide us uh, for our typically American audience here uh -huh. um, through the process of kind of high school to 
the uh, college application and going off to college? How does that how does that differ for Chinese that are staying in in China and those that want to go abroad? And what are they what are they looking to gain through that experience? Mm -hmm. Okay, so. So essentially, uh, a typical Chinese high school curriculum has no sympathy for students who want to study abroad. They are not tracked any differently than regular students. They must prepare for the Gaokao, which is the Chinese college entrance examination. Mm -hmm. When they make the decision to study abroad, it has to be quite early, sometimes even as early as ninth grade. So it's a lot of pressure upon Chinese students and their parents. Mm -hmm. um, they make that decision, but what... So 9th or 10th grade, they need to decide if they're going, what university they want to study at. They have to decide whether or not they want to study in China and wholeheartedly prepare for the Chinese college entrance exam, mm -hmm. or whether they want to just sort of leave some, of the, some elements of their academics in China on the wayside and begin preparing for things like the SAT, AP tests, okay. yeah. which they will study for on their own. Oh, so, th so they really don't have any of that support structure like you would if you're going to a college prep school here or if you had AP in your... That in support your structure comes yeah. from companies like ours that okay. would then kind of swoop in and say, hey, we can offer you these resources and, and tutor you along the way. Mm -hmm. um, that's just the academic portion, though. Mm -hmm. What a lot of college, college admissions officers in the U.S. Uh, won't admit to but realize is that essentially the last year of high school for Chinese students is a review, is a review of all the material before in preparation for the college, the Chinese college entrance examination. Okay. So essentially what happens when you choose to study abroad is that you have this whole year that you oh, wow. could devote to, unfortunately, just TOEFL and SAT mm -hmm. and, you know, just sort of bulking yourself up in those, in those mm -hmm. kinds of um, mm -hmm. test-taking skills. But we try to come in and say, hey, look at this year as a gap year, as an opportunity to curate a whole year of your life the way you want to and still be successful in sort of standard metrics. Okay, so, so then how is that different? What do you mean by curate? What, what are you pushing these students to head towards then? Well, essentially we want them to take even more responsibility for their own lives. You know, it's it's unreasonable usually to ask a, a high school student to establish a passion and then pursue it somehow, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a lot of the times what colleges are looking to see evidence of um, on a resume or in a personal yeah. statement. But we say, hey, let's begin to think about ways in which we could explore your passions or your potential passions. Now, uh, you know, this may sound a little like stereotyping, but it's not, that's not typically something discussed or at least in my you know, view of, of Chinese families, uh, Chinese parents are not typically asking their students what their passion is <laughs> uh, and how can they explore it. So is that, do you find support from parents to? You know, we do. Um, I have to say that some of the parents I've worked with across China in Shanghai, Beijing, and smaller cities are all extremely forward looking and mm. really, really open. If they're open to their, to their child studying abroad, it usually means that they're open to maximizing their child's potential in other okay. ways. So how do you, how would you pitch them within the Chinese context? Well, within that context, what we're, what we're sort of fighting against or trying to differentiate ourselves from is a whole industry dedicated to um, essentially defrauding the college admissions process in the U.S. So, and that's something, yeah, I meant yeah. to get to is, is then are you competing with others? You know, I know that this has been an issue of, you know, having your college entrance exams written for you or your essays written for exactly. you. Exactly, yeah. And in a sense, uh, how is that perceived within Chinese culture? Is that, is that seen as cheating? Well, I think, I think the old refrain is that within, within, especially within a business context, but also within an educational context for their children, um, the means usually justify the end. Uh, so, whatever it takes, if the result is good, then the means are sort of, um, there's, there's less of a, of, a, of a sort of moral itch mm -hmm. attached to the means. So then how... <laughs> Which is tough to work with yeah. as someone who wants to uphold an ethical practice. Then d do you get pushed sometimes from students or, or parents that uh, think that you should pr be providing 
Um, it's constant. Okay. It's constant. There is within such a, an industry that has so many gray areas as to what constitutes coaching versus, you know, all out ghostwriting um, or fraud. Um, there's this constant um, sort of customer service or customer management dimension where you have to educate the parents as much as you're educating the student in your process. Mm -hmm. But that being said, we do actively encourage some students and parents to find other, um, other agencies to work with. And then, and I'm sure then you have connection with those agencies. Are those run oftentimes by other Westerners or English-speaking natives that are in country? Back when, uh, back when my, my two partners and I started this company in 2009, uh, there were, I would say, less than a handful of organizations like ourselves mm -hmm. that didn't have direct relationships with colleges. Mm -hmm. So that's a different type of, of big organization that funnels Chinese students to colleges and then get kickbacks mm -hmm. or commissions yeah. from that. We weren't that. We were strictly independent consulting organizations. Um, now, though, there are, you know, there's no lack of um, millennials, I'd say, uh, from the U.S. starting their own businesses in the, in the same industry. And what do you sense their, um, what is their business model that they're trying to promote there? I'm not quite sure. I don't follow what they're doing, but I think they all have some sort of angle that they're pushing or some sort of niche. Um, mm -hmm. one, one recent company that has done very well has specialized in just art students who are applying perhaps to liberal arts colleges, but that wanted to uh, essentially style their, their high school educations around art. Okay. Yeah. So then I, I guess what I'm sensing here is that there's a, you know, in the United States, uh, we tend to put a focus on portfolios and students having, being a little bit more diverse mm -hmm. in their, that means community service, that means having a diverse array of academic experience, um, being involved in your being involved in your community. Right. Uh, is that something that you have to teach uh, your Chinese clients uh, is important? Because that's a different worldview as what we think of um, uh, a liberal education should be and what somebody going into college, uh, what aspects are going to enhance their college experience. You know, I really admire um, Chinese people for their incredible ability to learn and interest in learning. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that uh, in some ways when I first started this business with my, my co-founders, uh, we were doing a lot of the talking. We were educating um, Chinese parents as to, you know, the expectations of the college admissions process and why, say, for example, failing big was even more interesting than um, succeeding small. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say towards the end of, of my time in China, within the last five or six years, um, parents were telling me new things about you know, the, the subtleties of what admissions officers are looking for. So there was a definite shift, I'd say, within the last half decade, in which you have extremely well-educated well Chinese parents, um, at least with respect to the study abroad industry. And on that note, we're going to go to break. Uh, this has been Liza Ryan with Community Matters and Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you. Aloha, my name is Miley Scarpino, and I'm the host of the Empower Hour. If you're interested in health, nutrition, fitness, here on the island of Oahu, want to learn more about places to train at or different trainers available, then watch my show on Fridays at 3. We have a great time, and I hope that you'll come join us. Much aloha. Now go get swole. Aloha. I'm Hunter Hevelin, host of Sustainable Hawaii here at Think Tech Hawaii. You can tune in every week on Thursday at 2 p.m. to see interviews with sustainability professionals from around the state and even further abroad, learning about activities with water management, food security, waste management, and a whole host of other uh, fascinating opportunities to get engaged with making a greener island. So if you're interested in making the transition from consuming, consuming individuals to communities of producers, check us out every Thursday. Aloha. Hi, you're watching Community Matters with Liza Ryan on Think Tech Hawaii. And today we're with Bo Rowland talking about international education and cultivating the whole person. Welcome back, Bo. Thank you. <laughs> 
So before we went to break, we were talking about your company, Zeal Education Group in China, and working as consultants for Chinese high school students looking to study abroad in the U.S. Um, and other Western countries, possibly the U.K., mm -hmm. um, and what that looks like in China and your experiences. So maybe we can talk a little bit more about the specifics of Zeal Education Group and where you were in China and the students that you're working with. So why Zeal? Why Zeal? Um, well, specifically, you know, we had this, this vision of high-touch mentorship. Um, we wanted to not just be college counselors or not just be academic counselors, um, but really look at the whole person and say, well, hey, this student may not be the best student, and they may not get into top 50 or top 20 schools, um, but they have a genuine interest in studying abroad. They want to try. They haven't fit the Chinese education system. How can we help them? How can we help them thrive? That's an interesting point. So do you, um, are many of the students that you're working with, you say they don't fit the Chinese education system. What does that mean? Well, you, usually it means that they, they're not uh, either as um, academically oriented or they just don't uh, appreciate Chinese high school or they're, perhaps they have outside passions for basketball or for environmental activism. Mm -hmm. um, that that don't really have a place within the Chinese high school context, which mm. is so academically and test oriented. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and then, but you're not placing them in high schools. You're placing them in colleges. So what exactly. is the what is the Chinese college environment? Is it just an does it an extension of the Chinese high school kind of environment? Because in the U.S. we have a very different type of college environment. And uh, is that something that's attractive to those other Chinese students? Are they watching American movies and thinking it's all going to be frat parties and uh, skipping class? You know, I would say that that's a, very, that's a big concern of Chinese <laughs> high school students. Um, but to look at the bigger picture, China has undergone its own higher education revolution within the past two decades. Mm. So just coming at, uh, in the mid-90s, there were only about a million students going to college every year, matriculating mm -hmm. to Chinese college every year. But that changed in the late 90s and into the 2000s. Uh, there was over 6 million uh, freshmen matriculating every year. So as you can imagine, um, there was this flowering of higher educational institutions. But in terms of the quality of those institutions, we're, we're just now sort of getting, a, a, I would say, a revisionary culture. Chinese parents have been long aware of the, the quality sort of gap um, in a flowering of mm -hmm. ed higher educational institutions. And so what's happening is not only are they attracted by the, the having their, their child get a global education in some sense and, you know, mm -hmm. solidly master English, but they're also not interested in their, in their child, frankly, um, being put into sort of a holding tank for three to four years in China. Okay. So then are these colleges being state-run, or they're run by private organizations, or? Both. Both. They're usually state-run, um, or state-funded. Yeah. Um, but China is moving towards a, a more privatized model with, with, with a, a significant degree of state backing still. Yeah. And, and over the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of, um, you know, high-profile universities in the United States start to set up campus in China. Um, do you think that is a reflection of wanting to uh, why do you think they're going there? Because they see a market? Um, because Chinese are ac asking for higher level degrees or they don't want to leave China and yet they want to have a degree from NYU? Well, I think there's a lot of cross-pollination mm -hmm. going on in terms of uh, uh, American institutions investing, especially investing in China and in other parts of Asia. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for um, incredible research to be done between these institutions, I think is driving it. Um, so usually at the graduate level. At the undergraduate level, there are incredible experiments going on in, in liberal arts education, especially elite liberal arts education and technical institutions. Uh, so you know you have um, so this sort of controversial Yale in Singapore, mm -hmm. and um, you also have um, really interesting partnerships between Stanford and um, uh, Beijing University yep. and Tsinghua University and mm -hmm, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Now then, so then who would be drawn to those universities? Those are, are not the same students that are going to be interested in studying abroad, or are they? So 
those students uh, essentially would be extremely well per well performers within uh, the Chinese system. Okay. But mm -hmm. in terms of sheer numbers, mm -hmm. that's just not that's just not Enough. scalable. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For for the people that we work with, especially. So then, still, I mean, if we, if we think in the context of the population of China and six million, you know, students going to, that's still not that many. That's still that's still a a small percentage. Um, do you think that's changing? Do you think the mentality of of Chinese people is towards wanting to give their children a tertiary education now? I think, I think, like in the U.S., uh, the 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 sort of societal um, expectation that a higher degree leads to a job um, is being eroded. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, within Chinese society, as within American society, there's this whole discussion about how can higher education best serve um, the economy um, and, our, and our children. Um, and that's really the practical end of the debate. There's also you know, the debate about the meaning of, the, of liberal arts, not only within the US, but you know, within China. Does a liberal arts education still have uh, relevance for hmm. for any significant population of students? Yeah, and in, and in the U.S., you know, we hear a lot about um, focusing on STEM and often kind of uh, you know denigrate our own yeah. ability uh, to compete against countries like Japan and South Korea and, and you know Shanghai, Singapore, uh, as far as our math and science skills. Yeah. Do you find that there are uh, within, you know, China's a big place. Mm -hmm. You were in one area of it, and the students that you were working with, do they have a similar perception or uh, a feeling of, of falling behind the U.S. In, in certain areas? You know, I would say that what I hear from my students who have gone through the process mm -hmm. and are looking for internships and some are looking for even jobs now. My first students are graduating mm -hmm. um, and, and finding employment. Uh, also, the corporate literature suggests that what, what is needed is not, uh, not necessarily um, X and Y and Z hard skills, but rather the soft skills dimension yeah. of, of being able to communicate well, write well, um, adapt to new situations, mm -hmm. learning how to learn, that type of thing. Um, in terms of what the job market is facing in China, there's been uh, a significant amount of, I guess I would say, qualifications inflation. Mm. So it used to be that, you know, if you had a master's, then you could get that teaching job at a high school. But yeah. now it's almost like you need a PhD, and that may not even guarantee you any job. Really? Yeah. But then with so few universities, then that's, that's it becomes quite competitive in order to get, to get to that high level, in order just to get a job teaching. Well, there are two, in, in a sense, that it's too easy to go to college in China right now, and, and institutions are actually looking to be more, more like community college and more like technical institutions that are, mm -hmm. that are highly, highly focused um, as opposed to the opposite, which produced uh, too many PhDs and too quickly, okay. at least within the last decade. So then with, with the students that you're, I assume that you've sent students off to the U.S. to study during your time there, and uh, did you keep up with them once they come to the U.S.? And is that a part of your, uh, the, uh, your company's mandate? You know, I don't, I don't know what it is, whether we just yeah. were lucky or, or what, but our students have been, have adapted so well to life here. And, you know, I just had, um, I just had uh, drinks with a student who was in town. They often come to Hawaii with their parents, so I, I do some hosting. But she uh, just finished her, um, her high honors thesis on modern Chinese intellectual history uh, mm -hmm. with Professor Vera Schwartz, who's like the leader in the field at Wesleyan. Okay. Um, and you know she's doing a Princeton in Asia fellowship in Hong Kong at a law firm. Okay. And that's been typical in terms yeah. of the level of um, integration and success of, mm -hmm. of the students that I've worked with. So I've, I've really been happy. And to some extent, some of the students have even become mentors and are now helping um, their underclassmen back in China. And when you meet with these students as they have you know, gone off into their other institutions, what are, what's the feedback that you get from them as to what are things that were helpful that you taught them? 
I don't know exactly what, <laughs> what it was that we did. Um, I think it's just that kind of amorphous, vague acculturation process where they get used to you know, what it means to tell a story in English or to listen to someone and to know when to speak um, and to not speak in monotone when, you know, when speaking English. Um, those little things, uh, more than anything, more than, more than say, you know, how to set up a bank account in the U.S. or yeah. um, how to choose classes. Now, is that like something that. that you help them with, though, those aspects? Do, we, you, are you, do you talk to them? Do you Skype them while when they get here? And <laughs> we do do sort of like exit debriefs where we're like, yeah. hey, you got into school, but uh, you know, the work is just beginning. Here's what I wish I knew when I was going to college. Yeah. We do those seminars, and often current students in college come back, Chinese students come back and do those seminars for their, mm -hmm. for their underclassmen. Um, but really, I'd say what it is is that ongoing informal friendship where you know, they call me when they're at Duke and struggling with um, a paper and, yeah. Yeah. And then they, that probably way. eases their transition also to making relationships within the U.S. with other Americans and English speakers and knowing a little bit more of, yeah, like you said, just how to have a conversation, how to act socially. And um, I know from, uh, personally, I, I grew up with, I have, um, I call them my adopted brothers, but I have uh, two <laughs> young Chinese brothers mm -hmm. that lived with us for four to five years uh, during their high school time. They were a little bit older, so they graduated at both at 19 with my youngest sister, who was um, had just turned 18 when she graduated. And, and I can see for them how beneficial it was. I mean, the, their English was quite good when they came, but by, by the end, they were so confident. Oh, no doubt. And uh, one of my little brothers, we laughed at, we laughed at him, he's, he's really gregarious and he's an artist and a snowboarder and he has a thing for, you know, for sneakers, he's right. got way more shoes than I do. And, um, and came from a very, very wealthy family in mm. China and there were certain aspects of his education prior to coming to the U.S., you know, at uh, 14 he was, his parents bought him a, an apartment near <laughs> his middle school mm -hmm. and he lived on his own. For 14 to 15, um, something that would be pretty much unthinkable uh, within the American context. But as you know, there's a rush of cash in in China and this nouveau riche culture. Um, do you find that companies like yours are helping parents and students kind of um, flesh all of this out and understand how China can be a part of the rest of the international world? and also fit into that, and, and a huge part of that is education. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, because I, I know um, we, uh, for my brothers, just experiencing um, American culture here and having an education here, there were some things that they thought, you know, well, you're way behind in these areas, but they had never had to write papers like they had to here, or they never had um, things like school dances and all of those other kind of accoutrements that come along with the American high school experience. And I'm sure that that kind of also um, uh, translates to the American college experience of this being a, a highly social moment of their mm -hmm. life. Do you think that is, is beneficial when those students, so of the students that you've worked with, do many come back to China? Are they looking to stay in the US? Yeah, that's, that's actually how I would have answered your broader okay. question anyways. Yeah. Um, I think, I think broadly, yes, uh, education has served as one of the best forms of soft diplomacy um, mm -hmm. ever. And it has, you know, long-term multi like peace multipliers. Yeah. Um, but, but in the micro sense, uh, I've been impressed with my students because um, where perhaps at the beginning I thought, oh, this is sort of a soft immigration, um, you know, pull, where essentially they're coming here and their parents will never want them to leave and they won't want to leave and that's that's the end of that but in actuality I'd say that most of my students are not um, you know extremely pro-immigration or extremely um, conservative and they were pushed to study abroad and they want to get back to China as soon as possible I see my students graduating or taking internships and finding opportunities that place them in between uh, both worlds and so I think that's inc an incredible positive development. Um, whether or not it's indicative of the entire, entire um, sort of Chinese student diaspora, 
I can't say. Mm. Um, but I think that within what within my own community, um, it's it's certainly a very positive trend. Okay. Yeah. Well, on that note, we're going to go to break. You're watching Liza Ryan on Community Matters with ThinkTech Hawaii. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is our flagship show, which plays 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. And the, uh, the supporters of that show are uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and uh, Hawaii Energy. And luckily enough, we have representatives of both of them right here today to tell you more about what they think about the show. Uh, Sharon Moriwaki at my left is uh, co-chair of Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and she goes first. Sharon? Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I'm so glad that we have this Hawaii, the state of clean energy. This was uh, two years ago when we started this, and we have continued it because it's so important, and there's so many developments happening across the state. And we hope you tune in every Wednesday, 4 to 5. It's wonderful. And uh, Ray is uh, Hawaii Energy. Ray, what is your thought about the same subject? Well, I, I agree completely with Sharon uh, that uh, we are talking about every Wednesday, 4 to 5, uh, we talk about some of the most important subjects that uh, are affecting the island uh, now and into the future. Uh, energy, clean energy, we need it. Uh, we often run into uh, new ideas that we had not uh, thought about before. Uh, we did just today, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think we're going to have more of that uh, in the future. So uh, come on down and uh, and. Watch us uh, 4 to 5 on Wednesdays, um, and we'll uh, see what happens. We'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha. Hi. You're watching Community Matters with Liza Ryan on Think Tech Hawaii, and today we're talking to Bo Rowland. Welcome back again. And we're talking about international education and cultivating the whole person. Now, your company, uh, Zeal Education Group, was working on consulting for Chinese high school students that are looking to get play or to go to college in the US or possibly the UK. And we've talked a little bit about what that process looks like, why they would want to come here, um, the differences between Chinese yeah. and American universities uh, and the tertiary education boom in, in China. But when these students then are, are done, are they, are they looking to stay in, in the U.S.? And we talked a little bit about um, this being a form of soft diplomacy and them being um, cultural translators. Is that something that they want to then use uh, for the U.S. with companies coming from China into the U.S. or vice versa? Yeah, you know, I think, I think there needs to be uh, some sort of um, more serious, higher level treatment of what we do with this essentially human capital because um, these are some amazing people. Um, the struggle that I see from my students right now in the US at these colleges, at, a lot of them at elite institutions, is, is that they are having to shape not only their academic diets but you know their internships and what they, how they position themselves um, purely based on their next step. They need to really think about how am I going to get a job that gets me an H-1B visa? Yeah. Um, the conversation right now, you know, it ends when you get your U.S. visa. It's do you, if you have any, if you let on to having any intention to immigrate, that's sort of, you know, that's yeah. not good. Yeah. Visa rejected. Yeah. Um, so following this wave of uh, incredible human capital migration to the U.S., mm. what are we going to do with that? Um, it's difficult to you know, uh, institute any sort of policies on high. Um, but I think, at the very least, we need to have a discussion about um, work practicum and what does it mean to get postgraduate experience in the US and why do we only give certain types of extended periods to, say, STEM? OK. Now, for you yourself, you, you grew up here in Hawaii and, now, and then lived in Indonesia working for the World Bank for a little bit. Uh, and then in China for five years, and you also went to college, on, you know, at Berkeley, and then Deep Spring. Where is Deep Springs? <laughs> <laughs> so Deep Springs is in the High Sierra Desert. Okay. It's just above Death Valley. Yeah. Yeah. And looking through a little bit of uh, their background, now they are a very uh, are a non-traditional program in, in itself. What drew you towards Deep Springs, and could you give like <laughs> a little example of, of what that education was like for you? Yeah. Um, to kind of bring it full circle, you know. 
Deep Springs uh, drew me because it was this institution that um, was committed to labor, academics, and self-governance. So labor. three pillars. Three pillars, yeah. What, what do you mean by labor? Four hours of manual labor a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but also an incredible amount of uh, responsibility. Mm -hmm. So the, the school is a two-year college. Mm -hmm. um, every student gets a full scholarship for the duration of the two years. And uh, essentially, um, you go to learn how to live within a democratic body. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was very appealing to me. I've always been interested in community. And I think that um, as much as that education prepared me in a sort of um, becoming self-reliant way, um, I wasn't yet thinking about how it would connect back to a, a career. <laughs> And so, and then from there, then you went to to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Okay. Correct. After that, no. So, with having such like a, a different perspective now, that I can't imagine seeing a um, a two year or four year program like Deep Springs in China per se. You know, I I almost met with um, one uh, multimillionaire who was interested in making a, a setting up a Deep Springs in China. Really? <laughs> yeah, but um, so there's that kind of uh, mm -hmm. societal ambition. Okay. Uh, to really innovate in terms of, uh, of education, yeah. but um... now, so so put yourself in the shoes of a potential employer of one of your students uh -huh. in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, what would you be looking at them uh, to attain? Is it is it purely their language skills? Uh, is it having a inter intercultural awareness and being able to translate? Or what can these students from China offer to you know, the American intellectual and economic capital? Uh, well, I think, I think that um, in large part, Chinese are extremely industrious. Mm -hmm. um, they like working hard, but they also uh, increasingly like working smart. Mm -hmm. And um, they're, you know, equally valuable, I think, uh, to an employer as, as any other um, entry-level employee, mm -hmm. except for the fact that there are um, employment considerations for the for the U.S. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in terms of what uh, what they could get, um, I think it's a it's an individual it's a very individual thing. Mm -hmm. um, what motivates someone to stay in the U.S. or to go back to China? Um, what they want from a first job? Um, I've seen a whole range mm -hmm. from you know getting hard skills, um, thinking they'll get hard skills mm -hmm. um, in in say Excel. Mm -hmm. um, Versus just, um, honestly, most of them are really interested in securing um, a long-term working visa. Okay. And unfortunately, you know, it's hard to get that from a startup. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of students who have even been co-founders of startups while in college, mm -hmm. and yet, you know, that wouldn't necessarily do it in terms of yeah. securing a visa. Because you need a sponsor. Yeah. And it's hard to be a founder of something in your own sponsor. Right. Um, so then... So there is, we talked a little bit about this before, but then um, these students are not necessarily looking to immigrate, or they are? I would say that um, they see themselves more, more globally. You know, some, mm -hmm. of, some of my students that are most interested in green cards are also most interested in working in Europe, okay. for example. Yeah. Um, but uh, for the most part, I think it's, it's considered a very practical consideration to get a mm -hmm. green card. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly their parents want that to happen too. Now for other, we're, you know, it used to be the case that many times international students, whether they were from India or South Korea or you know, less and less Japan, would come to the US, study here with the idea that they wanted to stay here. And increasingly, they are returning back to their home countries uh, and, come here, and come to the US to study um, purely for the education and the notoriety of whatever institution they're looking to get into. <laughs> Um, where do you think Chinese uh, youth are on that spectrum at the moment? Ah, oh, there's there's simply so many Chinese students that study in the U.S. Oh. right now that mm -hmm. uh, it really does run the range. Mm -hmm. You know, so so typically, um, I will say typically that uh, Ivy students, uh, Chinese Ivy students, will want to end up in management consulting or banking, um, and that's that's uh, usual. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, you have, uh, I have one Chinese friend, he dropped out of art school in San Francisco, uh, came back to Beijing, um, started 
started uh, composing a film about um, the experience of Chinese students abroad in mm -hmm. the U.S. And he traveled all over the U.S. on a tourist visa uh, doing this film. Mm -hmm. Then, when that expired, he went back to Beijing um, and eventually got uh, sort of an art artist's working visa okay. to do it. But, okay. you know, so there's a huge range of um, yeah. ambitions. And it, and it is, you know, it, it, you know, it's hard to generalize about China because there are multiple different economies and different yeah. layers and uh, as well, you know, working within a capitalist communist party, uh, the rules are constantly changing. Yeah. And so how is this, um, what is the future of the All Education Group and uh, for <laughs> Bo Rowland? Oh, well, <laughs> the former is much easier to answer yeah. than the latter for me. Um, you know, Zeal, Zeal is, is an amazing small organization, and it stays amazing because it's small. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard. Um, I tried uh, to scale mentorship. To, to really do mentorship well is a very one-on-one um, -on -one process. And the moment you begin to try to scale that, or one begins to try to scale that, it it becomes a little bit more um, systematic and less individualized, um, which is, you know, kind of, it negates the idea of mentoring, which is serving the individual instead of, instead of instituting a system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so because of that, I think Zeal will remain small, but impactful in its own way. Yeah. Um, also, I think that not everyone wants to take a risk and commit to a year of radical personal growth instead of a year of radical test prep. Mm -hmm. um, so, so in a sense, it is a small market segment to begin with, and mm -hmm. it's nice to work with nice clients. <laughs> and and as, as we wrap up here today, um, what would be your pitch if somebody said, you know, why is it that I should pour so much energy into cultivating myself as a person uh, rather than test prep or, um, you know, working to pass, you know, their TOEFL or their AP exams, which they should also pass, but... Maybe, maybe I'd ask them to think about the best friends in their lives and how their best friends change them or help them grow in, kind of, through diffusion um, over time in subtle ways. And I'd say, um, trust that the mentoring process could be, could be as impactful as that. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I know for myself, uh, having gone through very similar programs for uh, my undergraduate, which was also extremely um, uh, different than the average American, even though I'm not American, um, and having been mentored deeply, actually one of my, one of my mentors uh, that I've been, have had from my first year of college, and I, when she asked me to come and start a pilot program uh, in South Africa, I said, of course, absolutely, I would go anywhere for you because those bonds are so right. deep. And um, it is, it creates, I think that's something that we lack um, in schools these days, and then especially within our academic process, is that with so much focus on the academic personhood, of someone, uh, we forget all of these other aspects that they're going to need to be able to carry those skills forward yep. and weather the stresses and storms uh, that are inevitably going to come in life and build that resilience into them to keep innovating, to keep working on their projects, to uh, see the world in a different way. Yep. And uh, so thank you, Bo, for working with your students and, and educating in uh, a, a brand new um, Dias Chinese diaspora <laughs> in your with the you know connections to your own you know grandparents that came from China great grandparents grandparents oh way way back way way back um, that there that's something of giving back to your own community as well as to Hawaii so thank you so much thank you for having me on the mm -hmm. show I really appreciate it and this has been Liza Ryan with Community Matters on Think Tech Hawaii thank you very much. <laughs>